Yeah, we've got about three more minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am ready to begin, I guess. Um, and I, I will start by saying I'm Anita Taylor, and I'm going to moderate, I hope, uh, some contributions from you all who are here, as well as the folks at the, at the panel. I, uh, and I will chip in when we get to the community college section, because Roy Barco is not here, was not, unable to come, and uh, I was in that group myself, so it, it uh, it is appropriate for me to decide I might have something to say, although I expect Dar to say it all. <laughs> uh, I, am, I am absolutely delighted that we have this opportunity to talk about this today. And I know we're not talking to an aud audience of thousands here, but we are talking to an audience of posterity through the tapes. And I am so glad because in the first place, I am so glad in a couple of ways because to have these groups, the, the coming together of this thing that we are ha talking about today started in the 60s. And to have founders of all those groups still here and able to come is to me a precious gift. And not only that I am one of those, that it's precious <laughs> yep. to be here. <laughs> and a gift. But that, uh, that we are all relatively healthy and able to be here. And I, I cannot begin this session without noting that one of the most difficult things of pulling this panel together was discovering the people who were there with us that I didn't know were no longer with us. Mm -hmm. I knew that many had gone, but I did not know, know many and that, that were gone. And they were there in the trenches with us and we will probably call their names as we talk. And if we don't, we will do so at the end because they were important to this effort just as we were. Uh, we chose the, t the title, 1968 through 77, the decade that changed the face of the association. And I believe that to be literally true. And when I went back to this book, which some of you know, Changing the Players and the Game, written by Jack Daniel, telling the, the, his story and calling together stories by others who participated in the formation and development early years of the Black Caucus in this association. I noticed that Jack had chosen that same 10-year span as a, as a significant period. So great minds in the same channel. <laughs> we must be right. Um, I invite you to get a copy and look at this if you haven't. Jack will talk about some of it. He obviously cannot talk about it all. My, our, our pattern for, uh, for talking with you is that we will start chronologically, and that means we will hear from Jack Daniel and Mel Cummings, who were present and involved in the establishment and creation of the Black Caucus. And uh, that was a, they, were, they were great role models for those of us who were involved. Uh, Bob, Bobby Patton, who was involved, although as, as Quincy said earlier, I think there were times in the early days we didn't let him come to the meetings <laughs> of the Women's Caucus. <laughs> Quincy Brown, who was involved in one of the people who was on the list of 29 people who went to that very first meeting, and I was there myself. So we will go to that, uh, to that group first, because that group of people first got together in 1970. And then, to my recollection about the dates, it was 1975 when the group was called together Task Force on Communication, Speech Communication in the community colleges to begin talking about the relationship between those of us in community colleges and the S and then SCA. So with that order, Dar Wolven is talking about the uh, community colleges, and I've introduced Quincy Lee and Bobby. And they will go in order with no for more interference from me unless they start talking too long, at which point I will pass them a piece of paper that says, tie it up. <laughs> Jack. And you should know that Dr. Melbourne Cummings told me that of the two of us, I was going first. So I don't have any choice. <laughs> so much for alphabetical. By, <laughs> by way of background, I want to mention two things. Um, in 1968, the association was under fire for not being, quote, socially relevant. William Work was the executive secretary. 
at the time, I was a black revolutionary at the <laughs> University of Pittsburgh, <laughs> and the word had spread. And so being a black revolutionary, as I deemed myself back then, Bill Work asked me to chair this Committee on Social Relevance in 68 here at the Palmer House in Chicago. And I was trying to do that, but it turned out that Malifia Asante and Charles Hurst were even blacker revolutionaries. <laughs> uh, they took over the floor and said, of all the social relevance thing, the most important thing is the stuff about black people. So they just messed the whole social relevance meeting up. And that night we met in uh, Hearst's room, and the six or seven of us founded the Black Caucus, and we, although we didn't call it that. So, and then following that came the various groups. The other thing I want to say by way of personal background is that when my mother is a foot stomping, get down, sweating, fundamentalist, rural Virginia Baptist. <laughs> and she, if you don't say amen, she ain't standing in the room. <laughs> and you got to sing a cappella and so forth and so on. So at one point she said, son, what is that stuff you studying at the University of Pittsburgh? I told her speech. That's what we called it then. She said, speech? How can you get a doctorate in speech? I said, mama, that's what I'm studying. She said, son, you ain't going to make it. <laughs> I said, why not? She said, you can't sing. She said, I've heard you speak. And that Never one of your speeches do you end up with a song. You just finish up and sit down. And since you can't sing, you're never going to be any good. Well, I mention that because of all things, when I was thinking about the session, a song came to me. <laughs> and I still can't sing. And I still can't sing. But the song that came to me was, I listened to Randy Crawford's version of it, it's Everything Must Change. And in the song, some of what she says is everything was changed. No one stays the same. The song, the song goes on to say that the young become the old, the winter becomes the spring, a wounded heart will heal, and nothing, no one, nothing stays the same. But the thing about all of that is, as you know, is that every, although everything changes, the question is whether or not the change is significant. Now, just a quick illustration. Our good president, Barack Obama, if you look at him when he went into the White House, yeah. and you look at his hair now, something has happened to that man's hair, and he's <laughs> changed. It is a significant change. But if you look at the hate mail he got when he went into the White House, and the hate mail he gets today hasn't changed that much. He's still getting the most hate mail that ever a president of the United States received. So the question is whether or not the change is significant. And for those of you who are in the quantitative area, you know we have these standard deviations and tests of significance and so forth. And we get into whether or not the change in question is statistically significant. Now, I can't speak for other people, and I don't pretend to speak for African Americans because African Americans are quite a disparate group of people. You know, talking about African Americans, you make the same mistake as saying Africa, which is a continent and not <laughs> a country. So I can't talk about African Americans. There's too many different people flying under that umbrella of African American and black in America these days. But if you're talking about those people who I refer to as descendants of slaves who have been serving their time here in America, when it comes to the Speech Communication Association and under its new name, since 1968, it is my opinion that not much has changed. Now, I don't have the psychometric data with me to prove it. But I read a book that said something like this. The most significant thing is the questions you ask. The answers give you a lot of facts. But the questions determine what is possible. 
for answers are possible. So if you say, who made the world, then you answer in terms of an agent or agency. But if you ask how the world began, some other answers are possible. So since I don't have the psychometric data, I'm just going to ask a few questions and be through. When it comes to comprehensive examinations in the departments across the country, are there any speech communication departments other than those at a historically black college? And we also would have to examine them closely too. But are there any of them who you can take your comprehensive examinations in African American communication? Required, not just a break for some African American who happens to be in the department right now, but all students as an area of competency is required to take the exams in African American communication, Hispanic communication, or maybe in a couple more years it'll just be the browning of America communication because white people will be increasingly in the minority. But is there any such thing as that? If there, this is taking place, I would call that a significant change, but I don't know where that is. Let's take something called full professors Chaired professors. Can we even find 1% of the chaired professors and full professors in speech communication departments who happen to be African Americans? Let's take academic administrators. When it comes to academic administrators, department chairs, directors of graduate studies, deans, in some cases, vice, uh, um, the provost, and so forth. Do African Americans constitute even a half a percent of the people who are holding the key administrative posts in this field of communication? Curriculum. I know that they say, you know, Jack, you can teach that black rhetoric course of yours, and it's so wonderful that you're doing that. And, but we're going to have to put it in as an elective. <laughs> uh, because they still have to take persuasion, and they still have to take, and they still have to take. But if we could find anyone with a three-course sequence on African-American communication to get past this notion that Everything about African American communication can be in a single general <laughs> introductory course, but Europe requires <laughs> postgraduate work. Then I would think there was some change. Students, I know you would like to hire some, but you can't find them. I've heard it too many times. Well, you're never going to find them, obviously, if the pipeline remains empty. So where is the aggressive plan across the country to increase the African-American undergraduate student pipeline? If that aggressive uh, program doesn't exist, for me, change is not significant. Senior administrators. A comment flew across the association, and it just, I didn't know it would return so soon. I believe that's Brother Taylor back there in the back. Yeah, it is. But every now and then, you know, like Haley's comment, that African American flies across the association <laughs> and makes president. <laughs> and then it doesn't come back again until you re elect Ron Jackson in a few days. And I hope you do that. Yes. <laughs> you can at least do that. But the comment goes and comes. But African Americans substantively, systematically participating in the business of this organization, mm -mm, mm -mm. and the association itself. I look for the aggressive plan for diversity that has goals and timetables and accountability and rewards and sanctions. I, I, Maybe this is retired. I just retired this year, so maybe this has gotten to me and I just can't do research the way I used to, but I can't find it. <laughs> so in sum, if there were no black caucus today, 
is there was no, if there were no division. I asked some people early, would there be really any programs on black communication at this one centennial anniversary? Uh, I, looked, I, told some people, I looked at the business meetings and I said, other than the business meeting the two black groups are having, do black people really participate in the business of this association? And so I know some people are going to tell me there's been some change because after all, Orlando was president and we brought to elect Ron Jackson as president. But that's not even a 1%. <laughs> it's not even a whole percent. And so, and I know there's been some other people who've done some outstanding things. I know Malafia Asante is one of the giants, not just in this discipline, but a car in the academic world living giant today. I know that. But I also know that this nation right now is on edge about Ferguson. Mm -hmm. I know that people are so worried about my brothers and sisters, they don't even think they can accept the jury decision. So, uh, so I made a stop because I don't know <laughs> if people are liking what I'm saying or not, but I didn't come to be here, here popular. But I just want to say one last thing. The whole situation reminds me of Hughes's poem about you taking my blues and gone and fix them so they don't sound like me. But you know what he says in the end? But someday, somebody will stand up and sing about me and do the right thing. And you know what he says? I guess it'll be me. So we're coming. Thank you. <laughs>
what they were doing as scholars. It was almost most as if the schools that we were going to were different from the schools that they had gone to, even though they sat beside us day by day. What I'm trying to remember now is not the 50s and 60s, uh, when segregation was the law of the land. I'm recalling the 70s and 80s, when practically all of us who were in the, this room were dealing with segregation. Um, or the, 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 um, the, the things that ended segregation. Uh, for it had already been defeated. And I'm talking about debating and fighting with some of the most educated people in the world. Some who are probably ashamed of themselves and even now would say that they, they can't believe that they could have done what they did or said what they did or thought what they did. But it really did happen, and in some instances, it happens now. But because of the, the um, ability of some of our forebears to decide on getting these caucuses together, we were finally able to get a few things done. Initially, this organization discriminated blatantly that only the brave, the extremely determined radicals among us, like Jack Daniel, <laughs> um, would venture to speak or to bring her undergraduate students to meetings. The her is a, a, a woman uh, who has died. She died about three years ago. Uh, she was a, a faculty member at um, uh, a predominantly black institution in Baltimore. Um, Lu Lucita Hawthorne, some of you, I know you will remember who she is, but she decided that she would give the organization a demonstration of not just what the organization already knew or had seen from television about black people singing and shouting or on their knees shouting, uh, praying fervently. She decided instead to reenact riots on stage that would spill onto the audience. She brought them here. And she would have them to move everyone to tears by going right in their faces sometimes. She was, um, she was, she was quite de demonstrable with her students. Just to let this organization, for example, know what it was like to be discriminated against. For a long time, it didn't work. But she continued. Their monologues would bring the audience to tears, while caucus members sat finally triumphant. Uh, of course, each of you knew that we, as a very small group of blacks, were not as strong and not as outspoken as some of you, because you were already sticking together. You were already one people, and you were already a part of this organization. No one walked out. Um, we stood our ground because we knew we had each other's back. But it had to take that kind of cohesion for the organization to begin to notice, to begin to listen. They only listened because they had to notice something. And this was being taught to, to not only us, but to you, that something had to be done to change the way this organization treated its minorities. And this didn't happen easily. It didn't happen immediately. For we fought for a very long time, because as Jack said, they were in the organization at least five to 10 years before a lot of us came. But they stuck it out until people like Lucia and some other people came in and started to help them. We continued to do similar things all until we were able to get others to, to sort of join us. And one of the people who joined us was this little girl here. Um, she, she marched, she talked. She was on the legislative council, and several other people were as well. And because of some of them, they started nominating names of people that they knew. 
so that we could begin to have um, a voice in this organization. There were other things besides racial inequality in the United States and in this organization, but there were other, um, organi uh, other inequalities um, with other people that were also a part of this organization who had the same degrees that they had. And those degrees had come from the same institutions that they had come from. So there was absolutely no reason to say that one group was more important and smarter than the other because they were taking the same courses from the same professors, doing the same papers, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we um, are, are talking about today, about how this organization has come from the bowels of what the United States used to be to what it is now. And though we're not as pure as we could possibly be, we are so, so much better, especially for those of you who um, did not know how it was during that time. And, and, and the, the years, 30, 20 years ago, it's not really that long ago because I see people in this, in this room who were a part of it and uh, who can remember all the things. My, my name, my physical name, actually, uh, in, in Maryland, were a part of it. Not as well as we know each other now, but, but we knew each other. Um, younger colleagues would have found the attitudes uh, of their mentors just outrageous mean-spirited, and they were, and certainly unjustifiable. Others simply could or would not find it possible to believe that their mentors could hate people who had not done them any harm, who did not know them, um, and they were only uh, doing this to them simply because of the color of their skin. We all know about this. What I'm trying to remember is not the 50s and the 60s, when segregation was the law of the land. I'm recalling the 70s and 80s in this organization when, I don't know, when segregation had really been defeated and I'm talking about had been, you know, we got into laws and all of that that we had fought against. This organization was just like the United States had been. And one would not think that this organization, full of people who had PhDs, who really understood everything about you know, equality, because that's one of the things that we've spoken and read about. Um, but we had people like um, Malefi Asante, Jack Daniel, Carolyn Calloway Thomas, um, well, Orlando. Ron Jack, Orlando Taylor, who's back there, so it was back there. He's not <laughs> yeah, there uh, Dorothy Pennington. Well, everybody in this room. Uh, actually, who were fighting hard and are still here. And um, now we're, we still need not anything necessarily from this organization anymore because we are now full members. And I, I, I'd like to say that because of certain people uh, who were in, in, in this organization at that time, we were able to finally uh, come to an agreement <coughs> with the National Council that, that uh, we would be able to, to be considered full members. So we were able to get the, um, the, the uh, organizations that we now have that we should not have to have, but we all still know that we've not come to where we need to be. And we think it's necessary for all of our organizations uh, to, to exist. Because even though the Black Caucus is still doing very well, I'm not so sure about the other caucuses. And that's what we we're we want to continue to talk about and, and see if we can make some real progress toward it. Thank you. And as somebody who was mostly a bystander looking on, but learning lessons, no, I, could, I could tell you that the Women's Caucus went to school on what happened to the folks who were, these incredibly brave folks and their colleagues. And I'm so glad you mentioned Lucia. 
She was wonderful in bringing those students. She was wonderful in bringing herself and standing up and saying, in not an immense language, that, that things needed to be changed. And into that environment walked Bonnie Ritter, <laughs> Quincy Brown, uh, Bonnie Patton, or Bobby Patton, uh, along as an ally, and a number of other people. Jim and Casebro. Yes. Uh, so talk to us about the Women's Caucus. Uh, we decided to combine our time and have, so we can have some give and take uh, in the few minutes that we have. And uh, I, I, I'm here because of my uh, marriage to Bonnie Ritter for 18 years. And so I, I sort of thought of myself on this program as Mr. Outside, and, and to use a male uh, football analogy, uh, Ms. Inside, because Quincy Lee was there in the meetings and participating in the meetings, and so she can give you uh, that perspective. And uh, this has been quite a challenge, and it's been a difficult process uh, trying to remember the chronology and fit the important pieces together after more than 40 years. And we, so we thought we'd talk about before the caucus, the beginning of the caucus, and then if we, if we have some time after the caucus uh, was formed. Uh, but before the caucus, and I, I will start back in 1963, because it was, that was the year that Quincy Lee and I first became professionally associated at what was then the University of Wichita, where I was debate coach and she came as the assistant debate coach. And Bonnie taught at Wichita East High School uh, where I, in the audience, one of her debaters at the time, who went on to debate for Wichita, Bill Balthrop, uh, was a student. So uh, the interrelationships go back for decades here in terms of our story. And I have to say that Bonnie uh, was actively involved uh, to create equality, and as she had been involved in various civil rights activities, uh, and uh, at Kansas, she pursued her doctorate where I had joined the faculty in 1966. She completed her doctorate in 69. And, uh, and I'm going to tell uh, how it led up to the caucus, but I think uh, Quincy Lee should tell about some of this background. Go back with me, if you will, to the spring of 1970. I had just finished teaching at Wichita State and had decided since I was always going to be a college professor, I needed to go to KU and get my doctorate. So I started in the fall of 69, but in the spring of 1970, for those of you who were around then, uh, there was a U.S. invasion of Cambodia, which created a number of riots throughout the country and certainly a lot of protests. Uh, the National Guard shooting of three students at Kent State was another thing that was dramatic. And when you consider what's happened in this country with school shootings, we perhaps have become hardened to it, but it was a stunning happening at that point in time. And um, the civil rights movement was still moving along, struggling through all of the struggles that they had started back earlier and were still going on. And as Bobby said, Bonnie and to me, to some extent, had participated in all those activities. That spring of 1970, um, while all of that sort of rioting and protesting was going on, um, the student union, at least a good half of the student union at KU was blown up. So they closed the campus immediately, sent all the undergraduate students home, and a lot of graduate students um, stayed on campus because we were adults and we lived there. Um, and we set up a communication center at the, on the campus through the office of the Dean of Women. At that point in time, there were posters all over campus saying that there were two women from San Francisco who were setting up women's consciousness raising groups. And Bonnie and I, both being in communications and studying small group communications, thanks to Bobby and his books, uh, were interested in what was going on uh, in consciousness raising. So along with another friend, we went off to this meeting that night, just to, you know, in somebody's living room. And there were probably 40 or 50 women in that living room that evening. And so these women talked a bit about what was consciousness raising and how did you do it. They gave us, a, mentioned a couple of resources that we could read. And then they just said, one, two, three, four, eight, you go off and be a group. So uh, there were three of us that knew each other and five people who were absolute strangers. And we all just got up and walked out. And the nearest place we found was the unblown up part 
of the Kansas Union, which had a ladies' room, which in front of the ladies' room, they had fainting couches and couches for people to rest who were delicate and whatever. So that's where we held our first meeting. Um, if you have defining moments in your life, that was one for me, the beginning of that group. Uh, a couple of people dropped out. Uh, we added a few, and in the end, we ended up with about 12 of us who stayed together once a week, except for an occasional holiday, for t two years, two solid years. We would meet starting at 7 to 10, and then it became 6 to 11, and that group became one of the things that changed us all forever. Um, so if you look at what's happened in your life that changes you forever, that was it. But that also led to Bonnie and me and others who had gone through similar kinds of experiences as women uh, being interested then in coming to SCA. And I'd been a member since I was in college in 1960. Um, so we were coming to SCA and noticed, and for example, just a few odd statistics, uh, men were 72% of the association, women 28. Um, Males were 91% of the officers, and women 9%, which probably doesn't surprise anyone. Division chairs, 84% male, 16% women. So women were active and were participating, but in extremely small numbers. And so we got together, literally, in the 1970 meeting. It's, it was, there's a record of us having gotten together. Uh, I think it was in Bobby and Bonnie's room, and Ronnie bought some yeah. wine. Yeah, and a lot were, of wine. The, yeah, a lot of wine. <laughs> there were 29 of us at that first meeting. I, Nita was there, as she said. And that was the beginning. We decided we were going to form a women's caucus. Um, interestingly, the Legislative Council of SCA then formed a committee on the status of women during that legislative session in 1970. And they appointed um, Carol Taylor as, um, as and, the chair. And Anita, do you remember Carol? I do remember Carol. Yeah. I, I've, I've lost touch with her. I tried to find her. I couldn't. Okay. Yeah, and we haven't been able to find her. But she was active for a long time. Yes, I mean, and very active in the foundation a, of the caucus. The foundation, and then seemed to have, uh, have vanished. So the Legislative Council did form a committee on the status of women. The next written record that we have is a letter that Bonnie, and we elected Bonnie as our chair in a very ad hoc sort of way. We were totally unofficial at this point. But in uh, 1971, we asked for a room to have an official meeting, and SCA officially gave us a room to hold the Women's Caucus in 1971. We did get together, and we did elect Bonnie chair. Uh, officially, because we were then kind of an official body, we thought. Uh, at that meeting, we actually had 42 people in the room, and we have a list that we sent around, and we have the names and addresses of all the women who were at that meeting uh, in, in the, uh, at the convention. I believe it was in San Francisco, or maybe, yeah, San Francisco in 1971. Yes. 71, in December. In, at in that December. time, the association met between Christmas and yes. New Year's. Yeah. Remember that. Mm -hmm. And the next written record that we have was a letter that Bonnie sent on February, in February of 72. This would have been the next um, winter uh, after the conference to Ted Clevenger, who was then the, the president of the association. And oddly enough, he had been one of my professors when I did my master's at Pitt years before. But we gave out, a, she gave out, Bonnie gave out a list of the caucus goals. And so obviously we had discussed them and had voted on them. Um, and in brief, they were, one, more active participation by women in all phases of the organization. Secondly, she wanted increased convention attention to programs concerning women. And in this letter, she also later asked for rooms for two programs that the Women's Caucus would sponsor, one dealing with um, women and the, and the association and the status in the association. And secondly, women speakers in the United States was the second program. Thirdly, uh, she would wanted a careful survey and sharing of the professional interests and abilities and activities of women members. And that was not anything that was ever done by SCA at the time. It was later done by the caucus. And I remember annually for years through the 80s getting um, a request, a, a, a fill, form to fill out with all my current data and all my interests, uh, whether it be organizational communications, 
um, you know, whatever. Um, so listing your interests. Because that tied in very much to the fourth and fifth uh, items in the letter, which were revision of the SCA placement service. Now, Anita mentioned this the other day, that the placement service was something that was highly controversial because of the way they handled uh, a placement um, and that was so easy to discriminate against anybody that they didn't know. Because you never knew the name of the institution, but they knew you and your name and your gender. So all those gender issues, and, and that would apply to race issues too, um, being um, uh, neutral in the placement. And in fact, in the letter she says, if SCA doesn't want to change this, um, she alludes to the fact that the uh, caucus would be willing to take on doing their own placement service. Um, and then they wanted to, later on, she wanted uh, asked to review uh, the SCA officer appointments uh, for the last year and that year because that was another path to a success within the association. Um, by 1972 then, uh, we did have the two rooms and uh, we're uh, moving ahead. And I think Bonnie, Bobby then here can... Yes, uh, some of the other uh, I, I recall that there was some negative reaction to the caucus, and, and I, I, uh, I don't think oh, Bill on. Work was particularly happy with all the things that were going on. Fortunately, we had no. an ally in uh, Bob Hall, and I, I don't mm -hmm. remember the year, I was hoping she'd be here, but Barbara Lee Brillhart, now yes. Barbara Lee, uh, mm -hmm. became actively involved at the national level, at the national office, mm -hmm. and was very helpful in terms of our organization. But I thought this stood out. I look back at the 1972 program, uh, of the association, the speech, wow. speech communication association. And at 9.30 on December 27, there were two programs to call to your attention. And I think they sort of illustrate how the association was. The first was a wives coffee <laughs> hosted by the officer's wives. Mm. <laughs> at the same time yeah. at 9.30, and with a note that it may go beyond 11, was an action caucus on sex discrimination in the field of speech. How can the SCA now be encouraged to particip participate more actively in all phases of the organization? And Bonnie, who was then identified with Haskell Indian Junior College, where she taught, uh, that was her home for the time. She was a faculty wife in Lawrence, so she took whatever <laughs> jobs were available. Uh, Carol Taylor uh, uh, was uh, participated, and she was uh, 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 actively involved in that. And also on that 72 program, uh, there were uh, two programs uh, uh, combined. It was a dimension program sponsored by the Women's Caucus. Uh, and this one, one was good news at 1 o'clock, and then at 2.30, bad news. <laughs> and some things okay. change, some things don't. Okay, the good news were recognition of women who had been successful and active in the field. Jane Blankenship, I believe there was a program on her at this convention. Uh, Marie Nichols. There was a program on women in forensics. And I have to acknowledge that I think Quincy Lee was the first woman to coach the national winning debate team. So uh, to make sure she gets recognition. Yeah. Uh, but women in forensics. Uh, Carmendale Fernandez, who was a very active and very excellent high school debate uh, teacher, who was in the program, that program, a paper was presented by Joe Sprague, who is still actively involved in the association. Mm -hmm. Carol Taylor presented uh, a paper on Charlotte Lee, who is one of our pioneers in uh, inter oral interpretation, and a, and a paper on Gladys Borchers. That was the good news in the association. But the bad news then, the, the, the second hour, they had a uh, paper on women's placement, on grievance procedures, on commission of the status of women in the SCA, and this was bad news, and Carol Taylor was the presenter of that. And then there was a bad news program on the regional caucuses, the problems by Sally McCracken at Eastern Michigan. So this was uh, the beginning of the caucus. And uh, then things moved quickly, and I, I, I don't think we have time to go. We, if, if we discuss things later, we'll talk about some of the obvious implications. Yeah. Yeah. Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to look back. I'm so it glad is. you brought those, those programs because yeah. they, um, and, and the mention of Bonnie was very good at bringing a jug of wine to the caucus meeting. <laughs> very good. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't have quite that same kind of beginning for the group that became the section on community colleges, 
but there was a similar kind of coolness to the activities. Dar? Yes, yeah. It's interesting to sit here and listen to all of this because I've always been one that likes to look to the future, not to the past. Mm -hmm. My friend who chairs the history department at the college from which I'm retired has always resented that. <laughs> but <laughs> and she's always said to me, remember, those that don't know the history are condemned to repeat it. You know what I'm saying? And so when Anita first asked me, I really was inclined to say no. Because you know, I think that when you move forward, uh, you build on that past, but you don't have to dwell on it. But then I thought, no, I think it's important for people to know where we came from, even if it's one person that ever wants to know, because it, it does take work to build things. And even though things will be different, and they are different now at NCA, I mean, you've heard what's happened with the Black Caucus and what's with the Women's Caucus. And the same was true for community colleges, in that it was a, a big era of change in what was then SCA and had been SAA and now is NCA and I'm sure will be something different in the future. So I'm just going to refer to it as, as NCA right now. And that was that from, from my point of view and those of my colleagues in the community colleges, it was a very staid organization, a successful one. It was built almost entirely on research being the key to success in the field which was appropriate for what it was. But it didn't work for us, and it, and it didn't work for others, because the community college movement became very strong in the late 60s and the early 70s, and they are teaching institutions. They teach the first two years of a traditional college degree and also anything in the technical field that might be two years, and then you're ready to go out into the field or to maintain your technical skills. There's a continuing ed program. And they'd grown very fast. Even by 1974, there were well over 100 community colleges across the country. More than one in every three freshmen were already in them, and it was building all the time to two out of every three. And there wasn't a place for us here in this association. And so, just as I heard from my colleagues here and here, we had a group of people who were pushing and rumbling and saying, are you going to make a place for us or not? And we were considered very much second-class citizens in this association, maybe third or fourth class, in that it, they were teaching institutions. The focus was not on research. And you were hired because you had demonstrated ability in teaching. You evidenced the desire to be a teacher in your application. You had more of a general background in your master's and PhD that allowed you to teach in something more than very specific, unique areas. And there weren't a lot of people who were available in that way that were the kind of people that, wanted to, uh, that we wanted to hire. There were community colleges that had one person on the faculty teaching co communication, probably in an English department or in a fine arts department, and then there were departments like mine that had 12 teaching full-time and, and 15 adjuncts and thousands of students every semester. Miami-Dade was the same. So it, it were very varied, but we didn't have a place here. And so we pushed, like everyone else did, and in 1974, a, a committee was formed by the leadership of the organization to determine if it should be more expansive to include those who had an interest that was different than that the research that was focused on in the association. Could there be a place for us beyond that? And if so, how that place might be found? And that was controversial, let me tell you. And so in 1975, at the beginning of it, six of us came together at the Palmer House. Palmer House must have been popular for having all these people. Right? <laughs> Palmer House was popular. I, I, and those six people, you know, I'd like to, to name them because I, they, they made a difference. So it was Mary Newman from a two-year campus of Pennsylvania State University. At that point, they had two-year campuses. Ken Fountain from Miami-Dade in Florida. Art Meyer from Florissant Valley Community College in St. Louis. Uh, Bud Zushner from Los Angeles Community College in California. Roy Burko from Lorain County Community College in Ohio. And myself from Prince George's Community College in Largo. And at that first meeting, Art said, um, Anita Taylor needs to be a member of this. <laughs> All of he them. was right. <laughs> and so, you know, at the subsequent meeting, then she was added. And there are so many other people, and if I start naming them, it, that's what my presentation would be, and I don't think that's meant to be. Plus, I'm sure I'd leave somebody out, and that would be a wrong yeah, thing, too. Right. But I'm sure some of these names will come up later on. So 
after meeting and discussing and deciding, we, we thought what needs to happen here is that there needs to be a community college section. That that is the only way to get any impetus in this organization because what do sections get? They get recognition. They get, they get to have people on the legislative council. Mm -hmm. They get to have programming that they're guaranteed to have. They probably can get a seat on the Educational Policies Board, which indeed did happen down the line. And so that's what we needed. Oh, well, that was very controversial because that caused a major change. You know, now you're going to have a division of these people hmm. whose focus is not on rhetoric and public address, whose focus is not on, on instructional development and research in it. And so we needed to pull together a pet petition with at least a, a hundred members, and then it had to be presented, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Legislative Council. And I will say that the Instructional Development Division was very supportive in that right. they even formed a subgroup for community colleges within the section to give it more visibility and, and in that way to say they should be having their own programming, they should be having a, a place here. And so um, it went forward to the Legislative Council. It was debated for two days on and off. Mm -hmm. I got tired of sitting there. <laughs> but, uh, but ultimately, the vote was very strong. Not certainly not unanimous, <laughs> but strong to formulate this, at that point, division, because that's mm -hmm. what there was. Well, then the major controversy became, why are they a division? Because <laughs> they don't have a research focus within the field. And it really didn't make that much difference. And I think that Bill Work, who was ex exceptionally upset about that, uh, <laughs> came up with, well, let's have sections, see? But then it was going to be only a community college section. So how does that work? All these divisions and a section. So what was decided was that there would be a section now at the level of instruction. So it became the elementary secondary section. There was one, the community college section, the university section, the applied communication section, and the student section. So now there were five, right? And I think, I think all of you know that the other sections have waxed and waned over the years, mm -hmm. but this one has stayed strong. And it really doesn't make any difference whether you're called a section or a division as long as you get the same opportunities. And now there's another section now, and that's the retired emeritus section, which mm -hmm. most of us sitting here will not belong to, right? <laughs> Move from one section to, to another <laughs> along the line. <laughs> and so, um, in order to make sure that this division, but consequently section, really was viable, it really took a lot of campaigning on the part of those of us who were trying to get it set up because you know, there was no social media then. Everything was done by mail. And so here we were doing massive mails to all the community colleges in the country, mm -hmm. letting people know, you know, if you come and if you join and, and if you show that you, you will make this your professional home, we will have a place, but you've got to put up or shut up. And so people did. At that first meeting, I mean, people joined, and there was a really good turnout to the first section meeting, which was in 1975. And I wasn't there. My twins were born two days before that meeting started. <laughs> oh, yep. You were yep. busy. <laughs> you know, and oh. I've always regretted that I didn't get to go to that meeting. But people were great. They got on phones, and, you know, they talked to me. I was in bed, <laughs> blah, 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 you know, in those days. And... Um, and so I took part in that way. But it was an exciting time then. And has it been easy over the years? Oh, certainly not. You know, like for example, that section now meets, they have their two business meetings from seven to eight in the morning because it's the only time they can guarantee that everybody who sees that as an affiliation can come without any other kind of pull or draw. And people come. I mean, I was really pleased to sit at the first one the other day, you know, and I counted 65 people sitting there. And that's something, it's, you know, at 7 o'clock in the morning, particularly when you had to get on the bus if you're over here and, and go over to the Palmer House and they don't even start running until 7.15 from here. So, you know, it shows that when people feel that they have a home and you do have to have a home base in an organization, you'll go out and you'll, you'll go to others, you know, but you have to have a home base where you belong. And I, and I think that's what has happened here. Now, I, I want to also say that the community college faculty members have contributed to NCA. For example, the gifts program that is so popular where you're taking back teaching ideas, um, that was founded by the community college section. Three of the um, past 
presidents are from community colleges. Sharon Ratliff and Anita and Isa Engelberg are from community colleges. What is now called communication teacher was first um, done on our campus by Isa Engelberg. Twisted her arm, pulled it all together. You know, we, we did everything but publish it. And now it's a major publication. So we give back as well as take, too. And I do want to end. I have two minutes. So I want to end by telling you this little anecdote, which I think kind of exemplifies me in so many ways and how it, it took a while for us to find a place here. And my colleagues have talked about this, too. Like I say, we were second and third class citizens in this association for a long time. And one of my esteemed colleagues at an Eastern University that I will not name <laughs> walked up to me one time at a convention after we'd had the section about three years and said to me, you know, I am really frustrated. We have this PhD candidate, and she's never really going to be a good researcher or scholar. But, you know, she can teach, and she belongs in a community college. He said to me, can you imagine? And, and I'm trying to be polite. And he said to me, and she's applied to several, because, you know, there seem to be a lot of jobs out there right now. You people are really mm -hmm. growing. And he said, and she's not getting any interviews. And I said to him, trying to be polite, I said, well, you know what? Maybe in her application, she's not talking about her interest in teaching. She's not talking about having a general enough background that she could teach a variety of courses at the, at the two-year level. You know, maybe that's the problem. And he said to me, but you know, he said, you know, she, she's not going to be a scholar in the field. But for heaven's sake, she can teach for you people. And oh, I've had it. I had. So I thought to myself, wait a minute, money, money talks, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I look at AAUP, I knew what the salary ranges were, and I knew that his esteemed institution didn't pay the salaries we did. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, you and I are comparable. We both chair a department that's about the same size. I said, I don't know what your salary is. I said, but you know what? I'm going to tell you how much I make, I said. And then let's see how you feel about this person that you think could only work for us. So I told him. His jaw absolutely <laughs> dropped. I was serious, it did. And he looked at me and he said, what did you just say? I, I repeated it again. And to his credit now, he smiled, he looked at me and he said, how do I apply? <laughs> <laughs> and my response was, you know what? I don't think you're qualified. <laughs> but, <laughs> but thanks for the interest. We, we appreciate the interest in it. But he and I became friends. You know, we, we had a respect. We served on committees. Um, you know, so we found our path, I guess. And we find our paths in many ways. And it's been my pleasure to be here with others who have found their pathways too. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Um, I, I love that. I will, I will only add, as a, as a person who was present at the beginning of both of those, the last two organizations, well, I was present at the beginning of the other one, I just wasn't involved, um, except as a, a person who <laughs> did my best to help you to go along. Um, I remember, I'll share one incident. I remember one time, and by this time I think I had been appointed to the finance board, and I'm sure I was appointed to the finance board because I was a wonderful double token. <laughs> I was both a woman and a member of a community college faculty. Mm -hmm. And I remember during one of the discussions saying to, and this fellow was also from an Eastern school, uh, oh. saying to, don't patronize me, XX. <laughs> we'll have to see if it's the same one later. <laughs> Well, we, we thought of this program as an opportunity, and I appreciate Jack making us look toward the future as we look back, and our, uh, certainly share your concern about looking at the future. But this was, in my, as I thought about it, a way to look back and not let us forget those stories of the past. Mm -hmm. And I invited a lot of people to come, and if they have things that they can share to add to our stories, I invite you to do so. We've got a mic sitting there. Uh, standing there, uh, <laughs> and I'd be happy for you to uh, to come and share a story. As people are coming forward, I just uh, uh, talking about after effects. Things happen very quickly, and uh, one thing I'm very proud of was that the National Communication or Speech Communication Association in 1975 did a conference in Austin, Texas, called CISCOM, and. Uh, uh, it was uh, combined with another a meeting called MASCOM, so MASCOM and CISCOM, and Bonnie and I were two of the facilitators. Uh, Liz Carpenter was our keynote speaker. 
We had a great attendance. All of the attendees are listed here in the index. And it was a great occasion. And it was reinforced by the presence of many of the officers uh, who were participating in this. So all of a sudden, uh, the Women's Caucus was recognized and effective. Yes, and I will, since you mentioned Barbara, uh, Barbara Lieb, I yes, will say Barbara was this. very proud of yes. that organization. And I see Orlando. Good. And, and because I want you on screen, don't talk to us. Turn this around and talk to, to the back. Talk to the that camera. Way. Yeah, please. Thank you. I'm so glad you put this together. And I cannot help but think when Jack was speaking about, I think it was 1968, we had that meeting in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm at the Leamington Hotel <laughs> uh, and, and during the summer conference. And I was thinking as you were reading, making your remarks, that, that you could have made that same speech in 1968. And the fact that you're making it today, 45 years later, is a bit depressing. But it's true. The fact that you have to make those kind of statements reflects on not only our past, but also our challenge going forward. The other observation I, I thought about was, uh, it was actually made, it was brought up earlier today in the earlier meeting <clears throat> when the past presidents reflected on the 1968 situation in NCA when we, in fact, many of us had written a, a petition to move the convention from here because of mm -hmm. some called the police riot that took place here in Chicago. Yeah. But uh, the move was to move to New Orleans <coughs> because uh, uh, it was difficult to move, change contracts and so forth. We went to New Orleans, many of us, Judy Pearson comes to mind as one of us, we were some of the ring leaders of that. We said we should not meet in a city where interracial communication was not comfortable. I mean, while they would let you in the hotel, if you were a black man walking on the street after the meeting to have lunch in New Orleans in 1960, 70, I guess it was by then. 70, yeah. You took your life into your own hands, so we, we did that. But the big point here is that uh, then, the, then you had the women's caucuses and you had the issue with community colleges. Seems to me that the lesson learned here is that there are a lot of marginalized aspects to our association to this day. And Jack, you contextualized it. And there are other aspects as well. Gus Friedrich reminded us, us this morning only 18 women have been presidents of NCA out of 100 years. I think that's 18% in an org. And in a, in a discipline is probably 80% women, thereabouts, roughly. Something's wrong with that picture. <clears throat> Your numbers about leadership, we didn't even talk about Latina presence, presence of uh, uh, Latinos, either one. <clears throat> we have a lot of work to do, and I hope that the main message here is that there are common concerns, and so it speaks more for coalitions across the caucuses toward um, voting patterns, <laughs> getting people elected to office, uh, policies enacted, and with the numbers that we have, actually, <laughs> you're talking about, you, we can run the association. <laughs> Just the women alone, the majority of the population, right? They are then now. you throw in the other groups. Right. So it's up to us, I think, to try to build greater coalitions across the inner caucuses so that we can, in fact, bring about the changes that obviously need. I think I'm getting a cold. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and for the record, that's Orlando Taylor. And Jack? I can follow up on your comments. Yes. Um, I was just wondering what would happen if all of the caucuses, division sections could come up together with a resolution to this association and request that this association conducts a formal survey of diversity within this association and based on the results of that survey formulate a five-year action plan. I think if we could get, I don't know logistically how to do that or whether people would even agree, but if all of us could come together and request, if not demand, that that take place and do the association conduct that formal survey and based on those hard data um, develop a five-year plan, that would be tremendous. That, that's a great idea. If we could follow, and you're right, demand. Follow in Lucia's <laughs> footsteps. She never requested. She demanded. Uh, are there others of you that have 
tales that you would like to share with us, for the record. Well, then, I have a request for the record, because not everybody will have read your book, Jack, mm -hmm. and other people have not lived through those days. Would you recount for us not the, not the details of you met, but the, the feeling and the experience and some of the response you all got when the Committee on Social Relevance <laughs> became sort of in the background while other matters became Yeah, more. it was, it was, well, first of all, the, the room was packed. I have to give the general membership credit. It was standing room only. It was a big ballroom, and it was standing room only, and they had set aside a special time for it. So there were people who were seriously committed. Uh, across the nation, students were sitting in, demonstrating, uh, books were being written about violence on campus. And although there were people, in a way, I guess for me, the members of the association were, I don't believe I'm saying this, but they were mild-mannered compared to the real people I confronted <laughs> in my life. I mean, back home, I was dealing with people who were carrying guns for real. I was joking about being a black revolutionary, although I didn't know what the hell I was doing at the time. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I was dealing with people who was carrying guns. I went to New York. Rhody McCoy was talking about uh, community control of schools. I stood up there like a nut and gave a speech about the Malcolm X model of communication, where Malcolm said, you can't speak to people in a language that they don't understand. If they speak the language of a rope, you got to get a rope. <laughs> and I went off from there. <laughs> that night, <laughs> on my door, I went, hey. And I rushed to the phone, dialing the zero or whatever number we go through. They start hitting and banging. And said, so, I'm going to just tell you on the record, since you asked. They said, nigga, have your black ass out of New York the first thing in the morning. I said, oh, whoa. So they ran. The next morning, I had to give another speech. <laughs> so in true Malcolm form, I went in, friends. And I know some enemies are in the room, because last <laughs> night, this is what they did. But. They didn't know I did have an advanced reservation to leave around <laughs> noon from New York City to go back to Pittsburgh. So when you ask about the association, my life was threatened three or four times at gunpoint blank. I mean, people disagreeing with me about what I was doing. Well, nobody in the speech association was carrying a gun. <laughs> they, were just, they were doing mild-mannered things such as having a wine a cork and for wine. women. So for me, in a sense, the association was duck soup in terms of some of the things that we were trying to get done. But for others, it was intense. But there's another part of the intensity that doesn't get talked about publicly. Uh, African Americans, black people, were in a lot of dissonance as this was taking place. Yeah. Uh, not all black people wanted to have a black caucus. There was disagreements in the rank. I'm sure up and down in the same group, there was yeah. disagreements in the rank. And sometimes the disagreements within the ranks were much more intense than the actual frustrations that actually that took place with the members of the association. So yeah. it's, it's, it was. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's important because yeah. while there are a few of us here who were there and know the intensity of those days, and Quincy Lee, you laid that out very nicely. Of, I mean, 68 was a very uncomfortable year for all kinds of reasons, yeah. uh, including, as some of you will remember, that the Central States Association was, was meeting here in Chicago mm -hmm. uh, on April the 4th, yes. 1968. Yeah. yeah, I remember getting off the plane, and that was the news, the shooting of Martin yeah. Luther King. Yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, so that, was, that, that year was a difficult one. Wow. And, uh, but it was time for people to stand up, and, the, and you all were incredibly brave. We had, yes, a dissonance in the rank, and there was some, some of the, I mean, women were most likely to be propositioned, not threatened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> Although there is a kind of, pro a kind of uh, threat that comes along with the proposition. Um, but the, uh, and, and the kind of coolness to the community college folk, we were just ignored because we really didn't go. Uh, but nothing to be worried about. And, and if I might just add another quick story. You made reference to Ted Clevenger. Well, Ted Clevenger was my advisor at Pitt. So, oh. the, and you asked him about the kind of tension. I wanted to write a thesis. I didn't know there was something called interracial communication. <laughs> I wanted to write a, a, a thesis that had to do with how People, black people could determine whether or not a white person was sincere just on the basis of what they said. Just listen in an interpersonal situation and based on their comments, what were the indices of insincerity? Well, I would run around a newfound black. I had to compromise. And I, my thesis entitled Negroes Perceptions. Oh. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't go with the black. I couldn't win that battle. I couldn't win that battle back then. <laughs> when I got to my dissertation three years later, I could move on up to black, and I could study black-white communication in the Hill District of Pittsburgh because we had a poverty program then, and so the government had endorsed this black-white thing, mm -hmm. and, and, and so it went. So it was that sort of kind of tension in terms of now, but then having done that, when I went to apply, and my first job was at Central Michigan University, <laughs> and I'm up there, they're asking me about general semantics course and the psychology of communication and research me quantitative methods in speech. <laughs> they didn't want to hear anything about <laughs> Negroes' perceptions <laughs> of. So I could make that choice about what research I was doing, but my career was on the line. And so when I talk about the dissonance in the ranks, you couldn't just up and call yourself being a black communication scholar. You might be a black communication scholar just like the starving artist on the street. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I like very much your, your willingness to lay it out right now and say how significant are the changes because we do clearly have significant, not significant, we do clearly have many changes that we can say from now, 68 to now. But I think it is, we raise a question of significance when you talk about the curriculum of things. It seems to me, and I will call it as I see it, uh, I think it is significant that in the distinguished scholar rank of this organization, Malefia Sante, who has Nash worldwide recognition as a rhetorician and theorist, theoretician of rhetoric, uh, is not one of those scholars. Mm -hmm. And so we have come a long way, but we have a long way to go. Remember that old commercial? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Come <laughs> oh, you've come, come a long, long way, way baby. baby. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I think we have, with those tales, and, and I, we still have a minute or two if anybody has anything they would like to add, I am very pleased with what we have put on the record that will be there for people to see when the next hundred years are people come around. Um, but there's some, there's some really brave people involved in starting these organizations. And, Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah.